And what number did you have? If you will, go ahead and open your psalm book to number 251. 251. Brother Joe's going to lead us in that. And then after that, uh, Stanley, would you word our graves? Word our prayer for us. We'll go ahead and open your Bible now to Jeremiah chapter 51, and we're going to begin at verse 30, chapter 51, verse 30. As I mentioned last week, as we were going through this section, chapters 50 and 51 are both very long chapters describing the fall of Babylon and all of God's justice and his power are manifest against this nation. I think it's important for us to realize that these are prophetic. That is, they were given before the event, and uh, it would almost be laughable if a person were to say, now Babylon's going to fall, while Babylon is at the very same time causing the fall of Israel. But 
God wanted his people to have hope. He wanted them to see the future, that it was going to be much brighter than it was at the present. Now, as we begin in verse 30, I'm going to pause occasionally and talk about a few of the things in this section that I think are valuable uh, as we go through. Let's begin with verse 30, and we'll read through verse 32. The mighty men of Babylon have ceased fighting. They have remained in their strongholds. Their might has failed. They became like women. They have burned her dwelling places. The bars of her gate are broken. One runner will run to meet another and one messenger to meet another to show the king of Babylon that his city is taken on all sides. The passages are blocked. The reeds are burn, have burned with fire and the men of war are terrified. Now, when I read that, I, I start noticing this great nation and their army now is humiliated. Um, I don't know how many of you have tried to keep up with the news of what is occurring presently in the Ukraine with the invasion of the Russian army. And uh, Brother Stanley prayed, it is a travesty that's going on. But one of the things that I read today was a report that many of the Russian soldiers did not know where they were going. Many of them were conscripts. And when they got there, they were told that the people were going to just throw their arms around them as liberators. And then they arrive and they find out the people there don't want them there. In fact, they are standing against them strongly and they showed some photos of some Russian soldiers who were laying down their arms and crying because they, of the atrocities that they were committing. They also showed a number of the tanks that had been blown up by the Ukrainian uh, military and that that 40 mile long uh, convoy of people was being, um, you know, just picked off. And they were surprised that how strong the resistance had been. And I think that as you look at that, you know, many of us would say, you look at Russia, look at Ukraine, which one of them has the greater army? Russia does. But you have there one side of people who have no will to fight because that's not their territory. And on the other side, you have a group of people who are trying to defend their homes and their families and their children. And it makes a big difference. Now, I'm not really... in interested so much in current events as trying to take that back to what it is said here about Babylon. The mighty men of Babylon have ceased fighting. Now the question comes up is, why did they quit? It goes on to say they have remained in their strongholds. They have, their might has failed. They became like women. Their hearts are not in it anymore. Now, I'm going to make a few more observations as we get toward the end of the chapter. But he says, they have burned her dwelling places. The bars of her gates are broken. What it is, is that Babylon is pictured as being destroyed herself. Not that she's going somewhere else and fighting like the Russians are. This is Babylon defending themselves. And they said, they give up. The men no longer feel like they have anything to fight for. Now look at verse 32, because I think that's, uh, or no, verse 31, then verse 32. One runner will meet, or will run to meet another, and one messenger to meet another. What it is, you're getting reports from all over the city. You've got a runner over here, you've got another over here, and they're coming, they're meeting, and they're all telling the same story. We've fallen over here. We've fallen over here. We've fallen over here. And uh, their hearts are melted because of that. Verse 32 says the passages are blocked. There's no way for us to get out. One of the things that it is said that Russia is trying to do is to encircle the city of Kiev. And the purpose of doing that is, is to block anybody from going out, but also to block any supplies from coming in. They want to strangle them. Well, if you live in a wall city and you are circled, could that be a serious problem for you? It would be a problem. And you've got to remember, Jerusalem itself had been put under siege. 
to the point where the people were so starving they would eat anything, you know, just even eat their children in doing so. Well, the reason all this is taking place is because of the way that they have reacted. Now, let's begin reading with verse 33, and I want to read a few verses, and then we'll pause to make some comments. For thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. When it is her time, or when it is time to thresh her, yet a little while, and the time of her harvest will come. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he has devoured me. He has crushed me. He has made me an empty vessel. He has swallowed me up like a monster. He has filled his stomach with my delicacies. He spit me out. Now, I want to stop there for just a moment. A um, couple figures. Figure of a threshing floor. Uh, you get on the side of a hillside where the wind would be blowing and they would take the grain and they'd throw it up and the, the wind would blow away the chaff, the grain would fall, fall back to the ground. And uh, there's a picture there that Babylon, it says, is like a threshing floor and it's her time. Harvest is ready. But verse 34 talks about what Nebuchadnezzar had done. He devoured me, he's crushed me, he's made me an empty vessel, but... Notice the fourth line in verse 34. He swallowed me up like a monster. You didn't know there were monsters in the Bible, did you? This word monster here is an original word that carries with it the idea of a dragon. Well, what is a dragon? <laughs> okay. This is a word to describe an animal which we don't exactly know what is. Uh, some of the lexiographers have said perhaps a hippo. I don't think that's it at all because, but I want you to notice when you think about this, it could refer to either a sea monster, which, what swallowed Jonah? Big fish swallowed Jonah. And what did that big fish do? Spit him out. Look at what it says in the latter part of verse 34. He has filled his stomach with my delicacies. He has spit me out. I think there must have been some sort of uh, sea animal. And what would you call a sea animal that was big enough to swallow you and spit you out? I call it a monster myself. And so that's the idea of what he's, he's, he's trying to picture Babylon's meanness, if you will. Verse 35, let the violence done to me and my flesh be upon Babylon. The inhabitant of Zion will say, and my blood be upon the inhabitants of Chaldea, Jerusalem will say. Now what we begin with verse 35 is, this is Judah and Jerusalem responding by saying, this is what they did to me. This is how I was treated. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will plead your case and take vengeance for you. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. God said, I'm going to take vengeance for you. Now, there's something in verse 36 that I think is really interesting. He talks about drying up her sea and making her springs dry. You know what that likely has reference to? Anybody? What's that? Well, not necessarily drought in this case. Yeah. The historian Herodotus, I don't know if you've ever heard of Herodotus or not, but uh, he lived 484 B.C. until 425 B.C. And he's considered the father of history because he wrote down the wars of the Persians. And he describes in very vivid detail the way that Cyrus marched toward his conquering of Babylon. And the first thing he does, he comes to this, it's not really a river, it's considered like a, a stream, and it's called Ganges. And uh, it is... You know, the water was sort of up, and it was swift, and he commanded his white horses to go down in it and uh, to cross to ford the river or ford this water. And when it did, it swept away some of his prize horses. 
And so he cursed the river. And he says, you're not going to do that. He said, it's going to be so calm when I get through with you that a lady can walk across it. So what he does, he has his men spend the whole summer digging canals to spread out the water in every direction so that after he got through doing that, you could just walk right, right across it. Now that really prepared him for a bigger task because the city of Babylon has water coming in on the north from the river, flows through the city with all the canals that would go in uh, various areas of it. It had a huge wall all the way around it, and then it would flow out of the city. And uh, the water would come right up to the base of the wall, so they didn't worry about anybody coming in, you know, under that wall. So as Cyrus got there, Herodotus records that what he did, he had his men dig a canal and divert the water into a basin uh, that was, you know, a natural basin that was a marsh. And when he did, the water went down to where it was about ankle deep. And his army marched in under the walls into Babylon. And you might say, well, why didn't the people there go ahead and, you know, as they came in, do that? Well, there's another good point, and I'm going to hold that for the rest of the story, like Paul Harvey, as we continue on reading in this text here. So just remember, there's another part to all of this. Verse 37 Babylon shall become a heap, a dwelling place for jackals, an astonishment and an hissing without an inhabitant. They shall roar together like lions. They shall growl like lions. Well, in their excitement, I will prepare their feast. I will make them drunk that they may rejoice and sleep a perpetual sleep and not awake, says the Lord. Now, I want you to notice verse 39. He says, in their excitement... They will prepare feast. I will make them drunk. That's one of the things that was a feature of the conquering of Babylon was they were so self-confident that no one could uh, you know, conquer them. The men who had been outside the wall, those Chaldean army, they decided to come inside of the wall and they had provisions prepared for years. They had a water source. And they had plenty of granaries, everything that they needed. And so as they got a little closer, they thought, hey, they can't do nothing to us. We'll just have us a party. And when Cyrus's army marched in, you know what he found? A bunch of drunks, people who were not prepared for the war. And as they came in and they walked up those canals, those canals made pathways for them to go all through the city and conquer them. Now, I think Jeremiah is using some, you know, very colorful language to describe that. God said in verse 40, I will bring them down like lamb, lambs to the slaughter, like rams with male goats. Oh, how Shishak is taken. Oh, how the praise of the whole earth is seized. How Babylon has come, become desolate among the nations. The sea has come up over Babylon. She is covered with its multitude of waves. Her cities are a desolation, a dry land and a wilderness and a land where no one dwells, through which the, no son of man passes. Now, notice verse 44. I will punish Baal in Babylon, and I will bring out of his mouth what he has swallowed, and the nation shall not stream to him anymore. Yes, the wall of Babylon shall fall. And here's another interesting detail. The fall of Babylon meant that Baal was not a true God. Number two, you'll notice the second part, I will bring out of his mouth what he has swallowed. Just like Babylon had swallowed up all the nations, what's God say I'm going to do? Your little puppy comes along and he picks up something he's not supposed to have and puts it in his mouth. What do you do? You grab his mouth, pry those chompers apart, and reach in there, and you pull it out. What's God saying I'm going to do with Babylon that swallowed up the nations? I'm going to pull them out. Now, he says, nations shall not stream to him anymore. Yes, the wall of Babylon shall fall. And then when that happens, verse 45, my people 
Go out of the midst of her and let everyone deliver himself from the fierce anger of the Lord. When Babylon falls, God says, okay, my people, you can go. You're liberated. You're free. And lest your heart faint and you fear for the rumor you, that will be heard in the land. A rumor will come one year and after that in another year. A rumor will come and violence in the land, ruler against ruler. Therefore, behold, the days are coming that I will bring judgment on the carved images of Babylon. Her whole land shall be ashamed. All of her slain shall fall in her midst. Then the heavens and the earth and all that is in them shall sing joyously over Babylon. For the plunder shall come to her from the north, says the Lord. As Babylon has caused the slain of Israel to fall, so the Babylon, the slain of all the earth shall fall. You who have escaped the sword, get away. Do not stand still. Remember the Lord afar off and let Jerusalem come to your mind. We are ashamed because we have heard reproach. Shame has covered our faces. For strangers have come into the sanctuaries of the Lord's house. See, the picture is given. God's saying, I'm going to bring Israel back. And so you're going to be able to come back into your sanctuaries, the place where you worshiped God. Verse 52, therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring judgment on her carved images. And throughout all of her land, the wounded shall groan. Though Babylon were to mount up to heaven, and though she were fortified to the height of her strength, yet from me plunders would come to her, says the Lord. The sound of the cry comes from Babylon, a great destruction for the land of the Chaldeans, because the Lord is plundering Babylon and silence with silencing her loud voice, though her waves roar with great waters and the noise of her voices is uttered because a plunder comes against her, against Babylon, and her mighty men are taken, everyone who of their bows is broken, for the Lord is the God of recompense. He will surely repay. And coming back to that point again, verse 57 I will make drunk her princes and wise men, her governors, her deputies, and her mighty men, and they shall sleep a perpetual sleep and not awake, says the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the walls, broad walls of Babylon shall utterly be broke, shall be utterly broken, and her high gates will be burned with fire. The people will labor in vain, and the nations because of the fire, and they shall be weary. Thus ends the description of all that God's going to bring on Babylon. Now, verses 59 through 64 is going to be another object lesson from the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Sunday night, I preached on precepts from the potter's wheel. The book of Jeremiah includes a number of object lessons and so verses 59 through 64 is going to be another one of those object lessons. And so here's what God says. The words which Jeremiah the prophet commanded Sariah the son of Neriah, the son of Amasiah, when he went in with Zedekiah the king of Judah to Babylon in the fourth year of his reign, and Sariah was the quartermaster. Now, I want to pause for just a minute. Do you know anything about who these people are? Anybody? Well, keep your finger here and just go back to chapter 32 and look at verse 12. Chapter 32 and verse 12. And see if you see any connection to this verse. First one sees it gets a prize. Okay. It wasn't Sarai who did in chapter 32, verse 12. It was Baruch. So if Baruch is the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, and Sarai is the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah. What does that mean about them? They're brothers. Y'all see that? They've got the same daddy and the same granddaddy. So that makes them brothers. 
So that means Sariah and Baruch are brothers. Both of them had a very significant role. Um, but he also had another position. If you'll look at the end of verse 59, it says he was a quartermaster. Now, I know sometimes different terms mean different things, but the Hebrew term here means a person who was responsible for the king's traveling arrangements. So that's his position. Now, it says in verse 60, so Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that would come upon Babylon, all these words that were written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said, Sariah, when you arrive in Babylon, see it and read all these words. Now, I want to stop for just a minute. Who read all of that Jeremiah wrote earlier? His brother, Baruch. You got two guys that their jobs are to read Jeremiah's prophecies to the people. Baruch read them to the people of Jerusalem. Sariah read them to the people of Babylon. That's, I think that's just more than interesting. Well, what did he say? Let's look at verse 62. Then you shall say, O Lord, you have spoken against this place to cut it off so that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but it shall be desolate forever. Now it shall be when you finish reading the book that you shall tie a stone to it and throw it out into the Euphrates. And then you shall say, thus Babylon shall sink and not rise from the catastrophe that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. He's supposed to take after he reads it, tie a stone to it, throw it out in the Euphrates, let it sink. And that's to represent the sinking of Babylon uh, and the fact that she would no longer uh, be living. Now, I think there's something significant in this. I want you to go back with me to see what we find um, in verse 58. Do you see anything time-wise in all of this? Verse 59. Well, the fourth year of his reign would have put this about, if he came in, uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in 597 and put Zedekiah on the throne, this would put it 593, maybe 594 at the, the most. So this was close to 50 years before the fall of Babylon. That's why I was saying it's prophetic. It's something in the future. It's something that is to take place. Well, that brings us to chapter 52 now. Chapter 52 is about a recalling of the fall of Jerusalem. And uh, you'd say, why does he go back and remind us again about the fall of Jerusalem? Why was it tacked on here at the end? Well, I, I think it's significant that the Lord saw fit to have this recorded in four different places. It's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 25. It's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. It's found in chapter 39 of Jeremiah verses 1 through 14. And now here at the end of the book in chapter 52. It's basically the same information repeated over again. It says Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. He also did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, till he finally cast out from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Now, it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all of his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around. If he comes in the ninth year and he falls in the eleventh year, that means that you have a two-year siege of the city of Jerusalem. Now, how bad could things get? For just a moment, I want you to think about the poor people who live in Kiev right now. Put yourself in their position. How much food do you have in your house? How long do you think you could live off of what you've got in your house right now?
most of us, you know, we have some stuff we won't eat, stuff that we just, we've decided we don't like, and maybe we wonder why we bought it to start with. But I dare say most of us would, if, the, if we stretched it a few weeks, you think about the people who are living in Kiev right now. Many of them are living in the subway tunnels. They're living in basements. They're, they're worried about their lives. And some of them venture out to get some food if there's any food to be gotten. I watched one report today where a, a man said, you know, you go out, but the stores are closed. There's no, no place to buy anything. You know, just look at what's happened in our country recently with the fact that stuff has not been traveling. You go to Walmart and, and you walk down an aisle and there's no food there. I mean, it's, it's empty. What do you think would happen after about two days of a siege? There'd be nothing anywhere. I mean, uh, the worst food on the shelf, you know, the ramen noodles would be all gone. And you see what the picture that's going to be. For two years, they're going to go through this. Verse 6 says, By the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. I mean, you're hungry now, and there's nothing to eat. It's all gone. Verse 7 then the city wall was broken through, and all the men of the gate, or men of war, fled and went out of the city at night by the way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans were near the city all around, and they went out by way of the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, and they overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. That tells me that he went out on the east side. That's where the king's garden would have been. It says that he went toward Jericho, and Jericho's about 10 miles away, and so uh, that's where they caught up with him. They took the king and brought him to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamath and pronounced judgment on him. The, kings, uh, the Babylonians is not there at Jerusalem. He's up at Riblah and Hamath. It's just like, where's Mr. Putin right now? Is he, is he right on the front lines with his soldiers? He's in a secure compound in Moscow. He's, you know, he's going to make sure he is protected. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and he killed all the princes of Judah and Riblah. He also put out the eyes of Zedekiah, the king of Babylon, and the king of Babylon, browned him with bronze fetters, took him to Babylon, and put him in prison till the day of his death. What's the last thing that Zedekiah saw with his eyes? Sons being killed. Well, don't you know that burned in his image? The last thing you could see is your sons dying, and there he day he stays in prison. Verse twelve. Now, in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, which is the ninth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house. And all the house of Jerusalem, that is, the houses of the great, he burned with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. Then Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the guard carried away captive some of the poor people and the rest of the people who remained in the city, the defectors who had deserted the king of Babylon, and the rest of the craftsmen. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left some of the poor people of the land as vine dressers and farmers. Now, the picture here is, is that he comes and he's going to carry away the best of the people. He's going to leave some poor people so that, you know, the, they can pay a little bit of taxes. They'll be able to do a few things. Beginning with verse 17, though, to me is an amazing thing. The bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord and the carts and the bronze sea and all that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried all their bronze to Babylon. They also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the bowls, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils with which the priest ministered. The basins, the fire pans, the bowls, the pots, the lampstands, the spoons, the cups, whatever was solid gold and whatever was solid silver, the captain of the guard took away. 
the two pillars, the one sea, the twelve bronze bulls which were under it, and the carts which King of Solomon made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all these articles was beyond measure. Now listen carefully to verse 31, 21. Now concerning the pillars, the height of one pillar was 18 cubits, 27 feet tall. You think about that. Then it goes on to say, um, the, all the capital around the second pillar was the same. There were 96 pomegranates on all the sides. The pomegranates of all the round of the network were 100. The captain of the guard took Saria, the chief priest, the second priest, and the doorkeep, the three doorkeepers. Um, and I want to stop here for just a point, just to make a point. It talks about taking the bronze sea. Do y'all know how big the bronze sea was? It held 12,000 gallons of water. It was 15 feet in diameter, 10 cubits. We're talking about from me to Ray that it at least is how far it was across it in diameter. But it was deep enough that it held approximately 12,000 gallons of water. We're talking about bigger than a baptistry. The thickness of it is three inches thick. Now you think about, can you imagine, okay, now it's your job to cut that thing up to take it back. Because you couldn't pick it up. It was, you know, it was meant to be permanent there. Um, this, and it says in verse 20 that these things were beyond calculation. There was just so much of them. Now, uh, verse 24, let me pick up there again. Then the captain of the guard took Saria, the chief priest, Zephaniah, the second priest, the three doorkeepers. He also took out of the city an officer who had the charge of the men of war, seven men of the king's close associates who were found in the city, the principal scribe of the army who mustered the people of the land, 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the midst of the city. And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took these and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. Then the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death in Riblah in the land of Hamath. And thus Jeremiah, or thus Judah was carried captive from its own land. These are the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive in the seventh year, 3,023 Jews. In the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem, 832 persons. In the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried away captive of the Jews 745 persons. All persons were 4,600. Now, if you say, well, now I remember reading some different numbers in 2 Kings chapter 24, I believe about verse 17, where the numbers are larger. You see, the critics of the Bible will say, yeah, they just, you know, they couldn't keep their numbers straight. Well, let me point out to you that quite often uh, they would only count those who were men of significance. They didn't count the women, they didn't count the children, they didn't count the extended families, the younger than uh, 20 years old or those older than 50. So the numbers would have been much larger. We're just talking about the people of significance now. Verse 31, now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity, Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 25th day of the month, that evil Merodach, the king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him. So Jehoiachin changed from his prison garments, and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king of Babylon, a portion for each day until the day of his death, all the days of his life. What does that tell you? That tells you that everything that Jeremiah had prophesied was true, it was right, and it was correct. Now, I've got about a minute and a half. Y'all didn't think I could finish Jeremiah tonight. I didn't either. But uh, <laughs> Lord willing, next week we're going to pick up with Lamentations. And as we conclude Lamentations, then I'll ask you what you want to study after that. 
But you can't study Jeremiah without studying the Lamentations that goes with it. But I will tell you, just a continuation, but it's, it's poetic. It's written as a funeral sermon. It's almost like you read Jeremiah and there's a prophecy, but then you get to Jeremiah and it's almost like you've gone to a funeral and you've heard the eulogy, so to speak. Well, it's not a eulogy. It's not a good message. It's a sad one. Well, that's where we'll pick up next week. Good evening. We would like to welcome everyone to our Wednesday evening Bible study. We thank you for all being in attendance. We also like to thank those who are viewing online tonight. I um, want to make everybody aware, anybody that may be visiting or anybody that might be viewing online is thinking about attending. I want to make you aware of our services. Um, they are 9 a.m. on Sunday morning for worship service. They are at 10 a.m. Sunday morning for Bible class. And that evening, 6 p.m., Sunday night worship service.
number 50. <laughs> Sorry, I got that backwards. I apologize. And the first song tonight will be 502. Sometimes when you're not doing the singing, you don't always think about the order of it, so... Those at home, Please be praying about and thinking about our upcoming gospel meeting here. Our gospel will take place from April 30th through April 6th with Brother Jack Honeycutt. There are invitation cards available to pick up and hand out. Be sure that you invite as many people as you can to our meeting. And also be sure to attend. Um, Youth News, Bobble Bow, our next and last Bobble Bow meeting of the season will be on Sunday, March 6th at Mount Leo Congregation. The church van will leave at 1.30 p.m. and return between 3.30 and 3.45 p.m. There will be a fellowship meal after the test. Um, Jason let me know that the Bible Bowl cram session has been canceled for that. So, uh, Very important, there is a sign-up sheet for Home Devos, and they're putting a, a really strong emphasis on everyone trying to be a part of that if you can. Uh, out in the foyer, there is a sign-up sheet now for the Spring Youth Retreat. Jason's asked, please sign up if you're going. He really needs to get that put together, okay? There's also a list of youth activities in the bullets, and I won't go through all of those, but please be checking that. Uh, Shut-ins. Shut-ins at home. But at this time, we will uh, begin our singing. <laughs> Let's all stand as we sing, please. Number 502, we'll do verses 1, 2, and 4. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me.
Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you're our great and powerful God and that we can come to you in an avenue of prayer, thanking you for all the things that we, that we have and are blessed with. We're thankful for our home and our clothes, the food that we have and the free country that we live in so that we can come here and, and <clears throat> worship you in spirit and in truth. We're thankful for Jesus Christ, <clears throat> our Savior, your Son, who from love came to this earth to show us how to be Christians, shed his blood and hung on the cross to save us from our sins so that we can have that hope of eternal life in heaven. We're thankful for many things, and we want to ask you to help those that are sick that's mentioned, help them to get better once again and be back with us, and be with those that's lost loved ones. Help them to cope and to, to understand that there is life beyond this one, and they can have the hope of heaven. Please be with those that's in foreign countries, Ukraine at this time, as they're battling for their own country. May you help them, comfort them, and strengthen them in their time of need. And be with us, be good examples to the world around us. Help us to shine as our Christian light should and so that we can bring more people towards you. Forgive us of our sins in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. We'll be reading from Acts chapter 16, verse 14 and 15. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us to stay. She urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. You never know when, you never know where you might come upon somebody who's interested, whose heart is open and willing to listen and to learn. Paul and Silas had arrived from Troas to the southern shore of Macedonia. They went up to the city of Philippi and went outside the city, and there was a place there where women were gathered together for prayer. Paul used that opportunity to preach, and it's interesting the way that Luke records this in verse, six, or verse 14 when he says, whose heart the Lord opened. Now, I know that some of our friends who believe in a direct operation of the Holy Spirit believe that somehow Lydia was unwilling to listen and that the Lord had to work some kind of miracle on her heart, but that's not what the text suggests. To open somebody's heart means that you tell them something that makes them want to listen and to learn. It's just like the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart when he told Pharaoh to let his people go. And as she listened, she learned, and what she did was she was baptized and her household. I don't know who might be here tonight who is in the same situation as Lydia. You're a person whose heart is interested in spiritual things, or you wouldn't be here. It may be that listening to God's word and the encouragement of others will tell you to say, I need to be baptized for the remission of my sins. We'd love to see a new brother, a new sister in Christ tonight. And I'm sure that as Paul and Silas were excited and rejoicing about what was taking place here, I can assure you there'll be excitement, not only among us, but among the angels of heaven. And so tonight, if you need to become a Christian, by being baptized for the remission of your sins, or if you're as a child of God needing prayers, we'll pray with you. We encourage you to come as together we stand and as we sing. Have you been to
Shall we pray together? Almighty and loving Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne of grace once again through the avenue of prayer. We thank you for that. Father, we are thankful for our health and well-being with, that we've been able to assemble together to study from thy word tonight. Father, we ask thy blessings upon all the sick and shut in the world over, and especially of our number here at Bobby. Father, pray that thou forgive us our sins, be with us always. Pray that thou be with those that are in war. Pray that they may find peace. Father, help us to assemble at the next appointed time. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>